On today's episode of What's Going On with Shipping, climb aboard the sailboat as we check out the status of the cruise industry for 2024. Welcome aboard. I am your cruise director for this video, Sal Mercagliano. So we have looked at many sectors of the shipping industry. Uh, we tend to look at containers and bulkers and tankers, but the cruise ship industry is one that really interests me, not just because I enjoy going on a cruise and drinking on board a ship, but I do enjoy the dynamics, the business side of this industry. And so the Cruise Line International Association, CLIA, has issued their annual report for 2024. We're going to take a look at it and break down what is exactly going on with the cruise industry. Now, if you're new to the channel, hey, take a moment, subscribe to the channel and hit the bell so be alerted about new videos as they come out. So as I mentioned, CLIA is an advocacy group. They represent about 95% of the world's cruise ships. And every year they have a huge shindig down in Miami where they talk about the status of the industry. This is largely done for not just the information for everybody in the public, but it was largely done for tra uh, travel agents and advocacy groups to get out of it. Now, understand they're a rah-rah group about the cruise lines. And we're going to look at it much more objectively. Again, what I want to look at is the real key data and facts that they put out in this report. Now, let me be clear. My shipping channel, we deal with the business of shipping. If you are interested about cruise lines and cruise ships in general, let me recommend a couple of great YouTube channels to follow. So number one, E. Sisman, who does super yachts, is fantastic, great about this. Now, while he looks at the yachting side, he will every now and then look at cruise ships and passenger ships, a great resource. He's been, for example, following what's been going on up in Baltimore. So a really knowledgeable person when it comes to yachting. Then there's the ship life, uh, great advocacy. This is a former employee who worked on cruise ships, has a great inside behind the scenes about what happens on board ships so that you get an idea of what ship life is all about. There's Captain Kate McHugh's channel. Uh, if you don't know Kate McHugh, she's a ship's master for celebrity lines. She's an American graduate of California State Maritime Academy, uh, probably one of the most famous uh, masters out there because she's an American woman who commands a ship. She has not just a YouTube channel, but a uh, uh, Instagram following. And she's recently been doing this captain's log, tracing her days day by day while on board her ship. This one I enjoy the most is Emma Cruises. I think she does a really great job of looking at cruise lines and being very good at giving you an evaluation. So if you're interested in going to cruise, any of these sites would be particularly uh, great for you to look at. One of the things that I think is really interesting from the CLIA report here is that cruise ships co compromise only 1% of the world's commercial fleet. Again, we spend a lot of our time talking about all those ships above, but even though they only represent 1%, about 300 total, and that's large-scale cruise ships, let's be clear. There's a lot of other cruise ships out there that are smaller. But these ships do represent a very unique aspect. And more importantly, this is how most people are exposed to shipping, uh, more so than cargo ships and bulk carriers and tankers. So let's take a look at some of the numbers. Where do the passengers come from? So looking at 2023, obviously the largest group of passengers we see come from North America. And we're seeing a growth in passenger trade. From 2019 to 2023, we jumped from 29.7 up to 31.7 million, a 6.8% change. And we're going to look at that little dip that took place between there because it's significant. But obviously the biggest one you see right now is in uh, North America with that big jump. Interestingly enough, we're seeing a huge reduction in one area, a one-third decrease in Asians sailing on board ships. This is remarkable, a big drop all of a sudden. This was an area that was seen as a potential growth area. So one of the features we look at in cruise ships is the growth and size of cruise ships, but we need to look at the overall capacity of the cruise ship industry. And from 2024 to 2028, they're predicting a 10% growth in the size of the cruise uh, ship capacity out there. So if you look at berths back in 2016, 482, uh, excuse me, 483,000 berths were in place, 590,000 by 2020, estimated to jump up to 701,000 by 2025 and 745,000 by 2028. The fact that we'll be able to put a quarter of a million people afloat on cruise ships is absolutely astonishing when you think about previous capacity of shipping. Okay, we talked about the actual numbers there, and you can see the impact that COVID had. This is the uh, fact that we went from 29.7% going afloat in 2019 to that 
massive drop that happened in early 2020 down the 5.8 million. Uh, then you had a little bit of a restart in 2021, but very limited. And then all of a sudden you saw it start resume in num some numbers in 2022, but then jumped back up in 2023. And we've seen that growth ever since. I should note that a lot of people talked about the fact that, you know, cruise industry would not come back after COVID. Remember, after Costa Concordia, where we saw 33 people lose their lives, there was a down, downturn in the number of people who went cruising. But then all of a sudden, that idea went away and we saw a resumption of the number of people who wanted to go out on ships again. I did find this chart really interesting because it shows you what the average age of cruise travelers are. So 46 is the average age, but 36% are under the age of 40. And the interesting group here for me is that Gen X and millennials are making up 46% of those who are going out to sea. So again, it's an interesting aspect of how things do change on cruise ships. So where does cruising go? Well, the vast majority of it hits down in the Caribbean, the Bahamas, and Bermuda for obvious reasons. It's close to the United States. You can get in a quick three to seven to 10 day cruise down in that region uh, without a problem. Uh, you see some up to Alaska, the Mediterranean's a big area. Uh, but the area that was really interesting to me is the 4.4% to other. These are world cruises, transatlantics, which are usually repositioning of, contain of cruise ships, and then expeditions. These are those cruises down to the Arctic and Antarctic that we talk about. I, I think the 1.3% to Africa and Middle East may be going down even more, especially after the Houthi. Uh, but again, you're seeing areas like the Mediterranean and Europe, uh, uh, without the med and then Asia, Africa, all seeing substantial numbers there. But the Asia China market is the interesting one. Everyone expected that one to increase substantially, but we're not seeing it in the cruise industry right now. So again, let's look at that source for where people are coming from for 2023 versus 2019 are coming from the United States. Uh, just really blows that chart out. Then you get Europeans in there, Germany, United Kingdom. And why are we seeing such a massive drop in people coming from Asia on cruises? Look at the numbers for China. That to me is significant. Why is it that Chinese are not taking cruises in 2023? Uh, from 1.9 million in 2019 down to 156.8 thousand in 2023. That's a 92% decrease. That is substantial. If you look across this chart, it's nearly increasing uh, across the boards. The only time you see some decreases, very minor, is, is Canada at 1%, Germany at minus 3%. But a minus 92% decrease in China, uh, a lot of questions there that I have about this. Again, looking at those top 10 de destinations, everything's in the green, everything's growing except Asia and China, where you see, a again, almost a one-third decrease uh, from 4 million down to 2.6 million. And this is at a time, by the way, when China is just building its first cruise ships. We just seen their pair, pairing up with Fincantieri, which is the big Italian cruise ship designer. Uh, Fincantieri made a deal with China through the Chinese State Shipbuilding Corporation, and they have built one ship. They're building their second one right now, and you're going to see more and more ships come out. Man, many have argued that Fincantieri made the pact with the devil here to team up with China to build ships because that is going to keep Fincantieri building cruise ships in Europe. But the other builders of cruise ships, Turkey, France, Finland, may be on the chopping block because they may not be able to survive this. Uh, maybe Fincantieri saw the, read the tea leaves and knew something was going to happen in the future. But now those numbers out of China are really significant. So one of the big things they talk about in the cruise industry is sustainable cruise industry. There is a lot of groups that target the cruise industry for pollution for a variety of different reasons. Cruise ships consume a huge amount of resources. They emit a lot of stack gas. When they come into terminals, uh, in whether it's in Miami or Fort Lauderdale or wherever they come in, there is a lot of issues associated with them. Uh, obviously, they have waste that has to be removed, but more importantly, it is the emissions from the vessel. So there's a big movement now to get cleaner burning uh, fuel on board vessels, to adopt new methods of propulsion. There's even efforts to try to shift ships over to shore power, to run off shore power and stop running their big engines while they're in port. The problem with that is it's a massive amount of energy that is needed and very few ports can sustain that.
if you look at the order book for vessels, it is absolutely phenomenal. One of the things that happened in 2020 with COVID is there was a lot of tonnage that was coming online. And what we saw happen in 2020 was a lot of cruise lines decided to scrap older vessels. Uh, they were planned to be phased out as new vessels came in, but as ships sat and, and waited, they needed to get the overhead off them. So they scrapped a lot of older vessels. They slowed up the arrival of new vessels as much as they could with shipyards kind of slowing them up. But now we're seeing a lot of those vessels come in. So if you look at ships launched in 2024, I mean, you're seeing the big behemoths that are going to be coming in for Royal Caribbean, uh, Disney, Canard, Princess, uh, all across the board. All these major lines are going to have massive in, uh, increases in the size and scale of their fleets. And you look at where those ships are building, it's overwhelmingly in Europe is where we see that. Europe uh, shipbuilding has been almost entirely taken over by the cruise ship industry. But again, China is merging as the new rival for this. So years from now, when we're looking at these charts and we're you know a few years out, don't expect to see all those countries listed there. Expect to see China added to this. And the number of ships, 56 ships, 121,000 berths, a $38 billion order book. It is absolutely impressive to see. Talking about ships running roughly around three quarters of a billion dollars apiece. So what does that fleet look like in terms of berths? Well, about 34% of the ships have less than 1,000 berths on board. So these tend to be the smaller size of the cruise ships. Now, these don't include coastal cruise ships, ships, of, for example, of American cruise lines that do just inherently United States cruising. These are much smaller. About 39% are ships between one and 3,000 uh, berths on board, and then 28% are ships that are greater than from 3,000 to a little bit less than 4,000. If you notice, the one area where you're seeing growth coming in 2028 is those 4,000 plus berth vessels, the big super ships. So that's the clear report, but let's go look at the financials. So if you look at the cruise industry, cruise industry is just divided into three big super companies that control most of all the cruising. Now, even though each of these names have a cruise line associated with them, a lot of them own other cruise lines with them. And if you look at the big three, it's Royal Caribbean, it's Carnival, and it's Norwegian Cruise Line. And when you look at the financials, there's something really interesting about the three of them. So if you look at the financials, here's Royal Caribbean. Royal Caribbean has basically restored its value from pre-COVID. Uh, you will notice the huge dip here that took place, a fall from almost over $100 a share and then bottomed out. Uh, at, at somewhere around the 20s, uh, it was it was a it was a precipitous fall. Uh, came back up. You might remember there was a resumption of cruising, and then all of a sudden the second or third wave hit, and then all of a sudden it is resumed up. And now you're seeing Royal Caribbean back to where they were pre-COVID. And you look at this company, a, a market cap of 32 billion dollars, is quite impressive. And so definitely Royal Caribbean has seen itself restored. And there's a lot of questions about why Royal Caribbean has been able to get back up there. And there's a few reasons why. One of them has been the introduction of just massive vessels. If you want to talk about the biggest ships that are out there, it is Royal Caribbean. The icon of the sea is a behemoth of epic scale. I mean, very few vessels are as impressive as this vessel is. Now, I have reservations about a ship this big uh, with this many people on board. Uh, you know, they had to get special dispensation for their lifeboats. There are not enough lifeboats on both sides for passengers to get off. Uh, you better take some time and learn how to use life rafts on this vessel in case anything happens. But in terms of absolute just grandiose size, it is the Royal Caribbean's icon of the sea. I mean, five bow thrusters, azipods on the stern. Uh, these ships just boggle the imagination. When you see them in ports alongside other cruise ships, it just gives you the idea of their scope and scale. Now, Royal Caribbean has been really good at managing itself. One of the things it has done is increase its capacity. These type of vessels draw lots of people. They want to be on big ships like this that have all the amenities and go into ports. The problem with ships like the Icon of the Seas, they can't go into many ports, so they're really limited in where they go. But Royal Caribbean enacted a strategy that was real smart. They, they actually eliminated a cruise line that was not doing well for them. They got rid of some old ships very quickly. Uh, they phased out their crews. And most importantly, they have been very good in their physical uh, management. 
the other cruise lines haven't been so lucky. So this is Carnival, and you'll see the drop here when it took place in 2020. Uh, Carnival, which was actually on a downward trajectory beginning before this, they were up at a height of over $60 a share, and they were on a downward trend, and they just absolutely bottomed out. I mean, we got down to about $12, $13 a share, actually down to $849, lowest right there. There you go. That $849, uh, they were down at. Now they're back up at $1399. So we're seeing that kind of little bit of an uptick on it. But Carnival had to do a lot of measures. They had to raise a lot of capital. And so everything from bonds to scrapping vessels to sh uh, selling more sh uh, stocks, uh, to really doing everything they can to generate revenue. And it's important to note that what, what has hurt a lot of these companies is that a lot of cruise liners were booked on cruises at the late end of 2020 and the 2021. And what the companies did was make deals with people who had cruises booked out, just delaying them until later. And Carnival did this a lot. They would sit there and you know make you a deal. They would add packages so you keep your cruise, just book it out further. And what that did is allowed Carnival to keep your money. It was great. It was like a bank. It's like, okay, we're going to keep your money. But now when you have your fleet full of people, a lot of people riding the cruise lines, especially over the last year or two, have been riding it with money they paid back in 2021. So if you think about it, a lot of the ships that are sailing last year were with people who had paid years ago. And so you're not generating fresh revenue. And that's a big problem. And that's one of the problems that Carnival has been doing with. They got a market cap at $17.5 billion. So they're good. The problem is, has been they just have not been able to get their stock back up. And they've been bouncing off the bottom here is really the lowest end of the three cruise lines. And then you come to Norwegian. And again, Norwegian was a very solid investment. You look at Norwegian, they were banging there right around $60. Uh, they were doing really good. You have it off the cliff here when all of a sudden that stock fell down. And then you have that kind of peak that kicks back and then the trough. And they have not quite gotten out of it yet. Uh, we're seeing that, that basically they are within trouble and you see things like uh, a new order book they're trying to update their vessels uh, Norwegian vessels get a little bit of a of, of a ding at times uh, they are not the probably the prettiest ships in the world very boxy but the service is usually great it's usually a stellar service on board usually good food uh, on board but Norwegian which is the smallest of the three they have a market cap of 7.4 billion dollars uh, they are trying to restructure themselves and come back up. Also, in many ways, they got in the same problem that Carnival did with really trying to keep people booked on the cruises, keep them out there. And now they're selling ships without full people on board. And plus, their order book was nowhere near the size of what RCL Royal Caribbean was with the monsters of the icon of the sea coming out. And RCL has just been able to keep that fresh group coming on board. They entice it uh, for people of all ages to come on board. Carnival tends to be a little bit on the lower side but again a lot of these cruise lines have different levels to it so you would have celebrity and princess and uh, holland america so all of them have their little subsets in them that focus on key regions and key demographics and all of them are struggling right now to get back where they were pre-covid but this is where the cruise industry sits in in 2024 i think it's a really interesting sector again it represents just one percent of the world's ocean shipping but it's the percentage that most people are most familiar with. And I think cruise lines can do themselves a huge favor by getting out there and doing more to educate people about shipping as they go out. I've ridden cruise ships all the time. And one of the things that's really amazing is they're in and out of ports all the time. Uh, they are the place where people witness what's going on. And I think some context is always a good thing. I mean, that's that's what I talk about. I like that. When, uh, when I do a speaking tour on a cruise ship, and I used to do it for American Cruise Lines, I don't do it anymore. Uh, but, but I'm available if you're interested. Uh, I think that would be a really interesting perspective because I think people want to know a lot about shipping, especially with what we see right now in the global supply chain. I hope you enjoyed today's video. If you did, hey, take a moment, subscribe to the channel and hit the bell so you'll be alerted about new videos as they come out. Leave a comment, share it across social media, and if you can, support the page. How do you do that? You can hit that super thanks button down below or head on over to Patreon and uh, become a monthly or yearly subscriber. And maybe one of the cruise lines will, will host a what's going on with shipping cruise. That would 
would be fantastic. That would be stellar. If we could have a what's going on with shipping crews, everybody come on board. We have a great time. If we steam through the Bob L. Mandap, we would all be hammered drunk by the end of it. It would be fantastic. Just got to get the Houthi not to shoot at us, which I'm not sure if I'm on the boat, they would not shoot at me anyway. Thanks for tuning in. Until our next video, aloha.